After hours of digging and sifting, investigators came up with this. The coroner, Dr. William Cox, tells me it's Ricky Beard's right shoulder blade, and it has a bullet hole in it. What it means is that a projectile, a bullet, went from the back of his body through the front of his body. And a rib bone found nearby, belonging to Mary Leonard, appears to have been severed, possibly by a knife. But even with this new evidence, police say they still have no idea why Beard and Leonard were killed. From Ohio Mysteries, the Akron Beacon Journal, and Ohio.com, this is Elusive Justice, the story of Ricky Beard and Mary Leonard. I'm Paula Schleiss, and helping me with this three-part series, which is covered in this podcast, as well as stories in print and online, are Beacon Journal reporter Stephanie Warsmith, photographer Mike Cardew, and my Ohio Mysteries co-host, Steve Yoder. Now, Elusive Justice Part 2, Homicide. In May of 1985, Employees from the Lord Mass Electric Company were laying conduit for a fiber optic cable through the Merriman Valley off Riverview Road. The owner of an adjacent property approached them, accused them of digging on his land, and demanded they leave. The utility workers consulted with engineering designers and inspectors, confirmed that while they were just 30 feet from the homeowner's drive, they were still on railroad property and they continued to work. Over the next few days, the property owner, the smell of alcohol on his breath, continued to dog the workers, seeming to become more angry every day. And on May 29, his agitation reached a peak. He threatened to go get his shotgun and shoot the workers if they didn't cease immediately. The foreman was tired of the hassle, told the man to go ahead and get his gun, but he was also concerned enough that he drove to the job trailer down the street and called the Northampton Police Department. The foreman returned to the work site and police arrived. The officers were familiar with the property owner. They had been called to deal with his threats of violence against others before. After the officers took the foreman's report, a backhoe operating near them caused something to go skittering across the ground. It was a human skull. Well, I first noticed the skull. I was back full, filling the ditch, and I noticed the skull roll down in, into the ditch as I was throwing dirt into it. At first, the crew and police thought the bone was centuries old. They lifted it up, set it on the cruiser, and stared at it while they speculated on whether they had just disturbed an Indian burial ground. Merriman Valley, after all, had a rich, documented history of Native American activity. But then the crew foreman noticed something that suggested the skull was much more recent than that. There were silver fillings in the teeth. Northampton police shut the worksite down and called Akron. Officers didn't need forensic specialists to tell them what they had found. A simple search of the dirt that the backhoe had turned up revealed pieces of clothing that the police were all too familiar with. Clothing that had matched the description of what teenagers Mary Leonard and Rick Beard had been wearing six years earlier when they went on a date to the movies and vanished without a trace. What Akron Chief of Police Philip Barnes had been calling the most intensive missing persons investigation in his city's history had ended, and a murder investigation began. The day was growing late. Akron Police sent rookie officer Bob Swain to guard the bones, while the city's forensic team made preparations to excavate the site the following morning. After sunrise on May 30th, the phones of the Beard and Leonard family started ringing from Ohio to Florida, 
from North Carolina to the Air Force Base on the Pacific Island of Okinawa, where Ricky Beard's brother Mike received the news. My commander came on and got me on the flight line. Tell me they need to talk to Red Cross and said you're getting a flight out today and be back there a couple days. I was glad that it was finally over with. I, I already felt deep down that that was the ending, that they were going to find bodies, they were never going to find living people, but that was finally an ending. At the Leonard House, Summit County Coroner William Cox wanted to break the news personally. Before we went down there, the coroner showed up at Mom and Dad's house Sister. when we were all there and uh, confirmed that it was Mary. And then after everybody calmed down a little bit, he said Ricky was there too. And so we knew both of them were there. And then shortly after that, we all went down to the site. Recovering the remains of Rick and Mary took all day. The forensic team realized quickly that the bodies had never been buried. They had lain on the surface of the ground for six years. But in dragging the dirt into its bucket, the backhoe had unwittingly mixed the bones with freshly turned soil. Mary's skull was released when the backhoe started to backfill the trench it had dug. And so the dirt had to be meticulously shoveled into screen boxes, a water hose doing the work of sifting mud from bone. In addition to their clothes, other items were recovered, including Mary's purse and wallet and the contents of Rick's pocket, his money clip, pocket knife, and loose change. The remains were sent to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., Summit County Coroner William Cox wanted experts helping to determine cause of death. But there was no need to wait to reclassify Mary and Rick from missing persons to homicide victims. And that distinction, while it cemented a horrible reality, also brought new hope. I thought, well, maybe now we'll have some clues as to what happened and we'll have some, some resolution to this. But now that we found the, the remains... Now we can maybe find out why, because that's the, you know, that's the big puzzle is why. Another silver lining about finally finding their remains was that Ricky and Mary were back in the news, and a case that had started fading from the public's attention was once again front and center. Rick's mom, Helen, told Channel 5 news reporter Tom Shea she hoped the attention would bring forth some new witnesses or shake up someone's conscience. I hope that someone out there hears it and gets scared or does something and brings, brings it out in the light what happened. The Smithsonian returned the bones and their report a few weeks later, and the families were given closure of a sort. They were finally able to mourn their losses. Their funerals were both held on Saturday, July 13, 1985 a Mass at St. Martha's Church for Rick at 9.30 a.m., followed by a Mass for Mary at 11. Both were buried at Holy Cross Cemetery in Akron. Many family members made the solemn pilgrimage to both gatherings. The discovery of the bodies had given police new information to work with, but every new clue brought multiple theories and interpretations. The final autopsy reports revealed brutal, violent deaths. Rick Beard had been shot at least twice, at the base of the neck from the front and again from the back through his right shoulder. Mary Leonard had been shot too, once in the back and twice in the left arm. But she also had a chipped tooth consistent with a blow to the chin, a stab wound in her ribs, a cracked sternum, and a fractured arm. What did it mean that Mary's death was so much more involved? Was Ricky killed quickly so one or more perpetrators could take their time with Mary? Or were the killers foes of Ricky who made him watch the assault on his girl? Or was it nothing like that at all? Did Mary try to flee a moving car? Could she have been unconscious but alive when she was dragged to the spot where she was found, causing additional injuries? Those are just some of the ideas debated by investigators and the families. I think they killed her first. And yes. yes. I think they made yes. him sit and watch. Yes. yes, I do too. She was tortured yes. and he had to watch, I'm sure. Bill Beard sees it that way too. 
it makes sense to me that they were beating on her to get him to talk or you know something you know they were torching her in front of him so this so he would say what they wanted to say or whatever and, and he didn't back down no he wouldn't back no, down from anyone not, he would not have backed down he didn't, back, he didn't back down from any of us, and it wouldn't have changed it anywhere with anybody else he's dealing with. The location of the remains was another clue. Who knew that the drive, slipping between trees and tall overgrowth with nothing really visible around, was even there? It led to a home, a football field away, back up in the woods, but it was remote enough that some local kids had tried to use it as a lover's lane. Somebody must have known that. Mary wasn't one of them. There's no way she went there willingly, her friend Carla said. We didn't even know where it was. I mean, it wasn't like it's something that we were familiar with. So you can't imagine them going down there to make up? I I would never imagine her doing something like that. If Rick and Mary had been killed where their bodies were found, how could it be that no one heard multiple gunshots? And nobody noticed the telltale smell of decomposition, since it was clear the bodies had never been buried. There were good answers for both of those things. I was talking to one of the police officers, and he said, first he pointed out, he says, what you see here now, it was, they cleared the area. He said, that's not the way it was. It was right. really overgrown mm-hmm. when the bodies were found. And I said, well, if they were, if they were shot here, and there was more than one shot fired I says uh, you know why wouldn't if somebody have heard it he said well he got the railroad tracks right there he said if there had been a train going by at the time he wouldn't have heard it right and he said as far as the smell there was a sewage treatment plant right, right. up the road he said they would, would have attributed it to that yeah. and now that the remains had been discovered on Riverview Road police could begin to speculate on the role that Rick's car played the night of their deaths Six years earlier, his Impala was found on an unused farm lane off Portage Trail at the entrance to a decrepit cinder block garage with rotting wooden doors. Bloodhounds, the lack of blood in the car, and other circumstances convinced authorities that Rick and Mary were never at that site, that whoever killed them drove the car here to separate it from the bodies. It was less than two miles between the two crime scenes. Did this prove that more than one person was involved? How else to explain that someone could expect to drive the Impala to Portage Trail and then have transportation away from this rural, sparsely populated area? But then again, there was a bar on the corner, the only business in the area back in 1979. Could a single killer have simply walked to the bar, mixed with patrons, and called an unsuspecting friend for a ride? Or Mike Beard wonders if the killer chose the location because they frequented the bar and took a chance on knowing someone there who would give him a lift. It's somebody near there that knew the location because I feel whoever did it knew where their garage was when they put the car there and they walked from there over to that closest bar and that's where they got picked up from or got a ride home from later. For the next 30 years, different Akron investigators would pull the story of Ricky Beard and Mary Leonard out of the department's cold case closet and dust it off. Unfortunately, three different jurisdictions had a piece of it over the years. The teens were from Akron, their car and bodies were found in Northampton Township, and the township later merged with Cuyahoga Falls. Somewhere along the line, reports were lost. As recently as 2010, Akron police were re-interviewing former Northampton police officers, utility crew workers, Akron officers who had worked the case 30 years earlier, trying to capture old memories. Here's Lieutenant David Whitten, who heads what Akron calls its Crimes Against Persons Unit just reading back it could definitely I saw how it hindered this investigation because there were interviews that were being done and people that were being talked to and statements that were made that people said well so and so told this to this officer when there wasn't no documentation of it um, that is speci- that's a specific example in this case well I heard this person confessed well there's no documentation 
So that definitely I could see where it did create some kind of uh, issue in this case. Another example. In 1980, police announced a source had told them the bodies could be found along the banks of the Little Cuyahoga River. It was a tip that made an impression. Authorities organized 150 volunteers into a search party. When Rick and Mary's remains were found five years later, they were just down the street from where the search had ended. The tip seemed reliable after all, but there's no record of it. If anyone had written down who said it, what was said, how he knew, that file is gone. There's also a reference to a sketch that somebody put out of a possible suspect, and there's no reference to where it came from. So, I mean, I don't know where that came from. Lieutenant Whitten is talking about when the Leonards hired a private investigator to help look for their daughter in 1979. The P.I. asked the media to publish the drawing of a bushy-haired man with a mustache, which he said a witness had spotted traveling with Ricky the night he disappeared. But police have no record of that. None of that is to say police weren't diligent. Actually, they proved they were willing to try anything to solve this case, even calling on the supernatural. Back in 79, when Ricky and Mary were still missing persons, authorities tried to reach out to the amazing Kreskin, a mentalist who had a popular TV show and had just been in town performing at E.J. Thomas Hall. He never returned their call, so they invited two local psychics to take a tour of the areas the teens had visited the night they disappeared. Nothing came of that. But in 2006, long after it was known they had been killed, Akron officer Robert Swain placed a call to a medium. That led to the story being featured on a TV show called Sensing Murder, where two psychics came to Akron, held clothing and bits of bone, and visited crime sites to try and stir visions. Lieutenant Whitten makes no apologies that his department was willing to exhaust every possibility. I have my doubts about their abilities, but then again, I was open-minded, and Bob was really sincere about doing it, and uh, I wanted to do, my philosophy is I want to do everything I can to support, uh, you know, the investigators, and uh, at the point, I guess I was thinking back, well, why not? Let's, let's, let's just see, maybe, maybe something will happen. One small thing about that effort intrigued to police. The psychics, who were interviewed separately, both said they sensed the involvement of a muscle car that was either red or orange. That was odd and unique enough that Swain went back and visited some old sources to see if anyone knew of such a car. But it didn't really go anywhere. It's something that we don't use often anymore. We just try to, you know, use more technological stuff now, you know, with all the search things we can have, radar, uh, dogs, stuff like that, we try to do it more, you know, conventionally. But I wanted to support Bob, and uh, it really wasn't that hard to arrange, and it was kind of interesting, because they claim they didn't know anything about the case, and uh, it's kind of interesting. I mean, whether you believe it or not, or that stuff, you think that stuff legitimate, it's still interesting. Over the years, police had no shortage of theories of what happened to Rick and Mary that summer night in 1979, but it's hard to find one single theory that fits all the facts and all the statements collected from dozens of friends, family, and witnesses. Next, on the final episode of Elusive Justice. I'm sure there are several theories that have come and gone over the years. Where does this theory of this gentleman being involved rank to you personally among all the theories? Uh, I think it's very strong. Most of it now at this point is circumstantial. But I think if you look at, uh, you know, looking back based on my experience now, how we look at cases, I think it's just as good, if not better than anything else that, that has been looked at.